All right, one thing I like to do in, in so many of my classes is to do what's called a one-minute paper. And don't worry, you don't have to write anything down or anything. It's not graded. I think, I think other teachers have you write stuff down, but, but I'm, I'm, we're just going to do this, um, you know, out loud as a discussion. And the idea of a one-minute paper is this. Um, name one thing, and I'll, I'll give you a minute to think about it. Um, I think that's where the term one-minute paper comes from. It's like, you don't have to obsess about this, just whatever comes to the top of your head. But give me one thing about the material we've covered so far that you think you understand pretty well. It can be anything, all right? Then give me one thing that you find most confusing or that you're still having difficulty with. So we'll go around the class and, um, and, and ask everyone for that. Um, but take a minute to think of the one thing that you are pretty clear about, the one thing that is confusing. there's at least one thing in the class that you're clear about, all right? And I would expect, I guess I won't say I'll hope that you're confused about something, but I would expect that there might be some things that are less clear to you than other things. So who wants to go first? Let's go with the clears first. What's something in, about this class that you're clear about? experienced a teacher is by how long they're willing to wait for an answer. 
that rookie teachers will ask a question and if no one answers, believe me, standing up here for 30 seconds of silence is a long time. So a rookie teacher will let it go for a while and then won't be able to handle it and will have to jump in. But let's see, I've been teaching full time for over 14 years. So I'm getting up there. So I'm prepared to stand here for the rest of the class <laughs> until we get an answer from everyone. Are we doing both uh, right now? I'm sorry, I'm kind of... uh, Yeah, uh, we're, we're going over clear now. Something about the class that's clear to you. We'll go over confusing in a minute. Or in 45 minutes. It's up to you guys. Yes? Okay, the way that a required field validator works. Okay, let's let me count how many we have. One, two, three, four, five. We have five, and there are eight people in the room, so three more. Yes? Okay, C-sharp coding, which again, if you've had intro to C-sharp and advanced C-sharp, yes? How to, how to program a button. Okay, how to program a button. Okay, one more. You already answered. I hope he didn't hear you, because then you can steal yours. Nick? Well, I wanted to say the button because I was I did something on mine I was kind of proud of with a button. Okay, well let's hear it. It might be a little bit different. Well, I uh, for the, for lab one and lab two we had to you told us to make different pages, but I okay found out how to code my button so it would go to a separate side and then code it to go back. Okay, all right. Um, so what's a way that we could summarize that? Button click events. All right. Um, For no, I don't know. Pardon me. I don't know if that's right. All right. Well, we'll give you. We'll give that one, even though it's similar to that. Um, you can. I can tell that you're not feeling well. No. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. You definitely sound like you have a cold or sinuses or something. All right. Okay. Now here's the good one. Something that you're confused about. And, and okay, I might not wait as long on this one, but here's the thing. If you don't give something that you're confused about, that means that you understand everything perfectly, which means I'm going to take it easy the rest of the day, and you're going to finish the lecture. All right? So that is, that is, uh, that, that's the possible penalty here. Something that you're confused about. Yes? Uh, the validator, the, how you're using the different validators. Okay. Different validation controls. Okay, next. Yes? Initial value of the drop down. Oh, An, uh, that's a good one. Initial value of the drop down. I could see where that, I, well, I can see how all these are confusion, confusing. Okay, next. Okay, that's, and that's a good way to put it, turning logic into code. Can we do one-on-one? -on -one? Sure. I had a hard time with the, uh, for instance, when we were designing our page, I had to hard code where I wanted my things instead of using the, uh, the uh, start sheet. Okay. Um, that might be a small thing, but I just couldn't get it to work. I, Integrating CSS into ASPX page. All right. Yeah, another hand? Um, linking uh, ASP controls into your code. Okay. Linking ASP.NET controls into 
into code. All right. Um, any more? Yes. Switching, switching between the two views gives you a confusing, it's not always clear why one view translates to another. Okay. Okay. For this, I will allow you to repeat something. Um, well, I was going to say the same thing as you do, just the CSS and the okay. ASP control. Right. Kind of so we have two votes. Around. Two votes for that one. Yeah, different validation. Different validation controls. Okay, two votes for this. All right. On the clear side, are there, are there anyone that has questions over any of the things that people said were clear? Or are these pretty well? Um, okay, as, as this is clear. All right, let's go in, and what I want to do is um, let's go over the things that are confusing then. And I'll try to do as much of them as I can, and uh, maybe I'll have to finish some up Tuesday and so on. Um, I do, um, you know, it, it's important to me that, that you understand the material. So we'll do this periodically. Um, I, uh, how do I want to say? Uh, we'll do this periodically. It's, it's a good review, I think. And it's important because, you know, if you don't get some of this stuff, then I can talk about the next topic or the next topic, and it, it's going to be a pain. You know, it, it, you're going to have a hard time following that if you don't understand the stuff up to this point. So I was going to talk about turning the um, truck rental thing into a uh, into an object, but let's get these things out of the way first. All right, so I see two things that I'm going to address first 
because this one got two votes and this one also relates to validation. So we can kind of kill this one right off the bat. All right. Um, so let's start. And I'm going to start with a brand new um, application that will just be used, won't do anything meaningful, it will just be used to um, demonstrate these, these points. Someone could hit the lights. I'm going to start off simple with a text box. I'm going to put a text box on the page, and then I'm going to apply different validators to it. I might actually put a couple text boxes on the page and apply different validators to it. All right, so I'll create a new website. ASPX empty website. I'm going to put it on my desktop. And I'm going to call it review. I'm going to be using C sharp. Click OK. And I'll go and create a brand new file. That's a web form. I'm going to keep it default.aspx. I'm going to click C sharp, make sure that that is clicked. And I'm going to make sure that I place the code in a separate file. All right. Just cleaner that way, um, good programming practice. So I click Add. Thinks about it for a while, decides if it wants to do it. Eventually it decides that I'm, it's going to do it. So I'm going to go make this bigger. All right, let's go into design view. I'm going to start out putting a text box a button start off with a required field validator. That, that's probably the most straightforward of, of validators. And what that simply validates is that there's something entered in the field. That's all it does. Make sure that there's something entered in the field. So if it's a required field, um, then you put a required field validator on it. That'll make sure that, that you enter a valid value. All right. The required validator doesn't test what the data is. You have other validators for those. That's one reason why this is so confusing, one second, is that um, there's validators that each do a little piece of the puzzle. So you have to choose the right mix of validators to get all the validation that you want. Yes? Can you put more than one validator? Or... Can you put more than one validator? Absolutely. So for example, we could put a required field validator on this. And then we could put a, um, a range validator. So the number has to be, with, be, be between 1 and 1,000, for example. Um, or we could put a, uh, a 
validator that um, validates that it's a required field, then we could put another validator to make sure um, that it's an integer. So we'll have two validators on it. So let's go and let's move the required field validator onto this. I'm not right now going to worry about the way it looks. All right, I'm not even putting a label on these fields. All right, but required field validator, you go here. I'm going to place it down there. All right. Now, with every validator, at the very least, you have to specify what control that you want to validate. So in this case, the control I want to validate is, well, I only got one, right? The text box. So I, but you still have to specify it because you could have multiple text boxes on the page and one might be required, one might not be required. It might be an optional field. All right. I then have the air message that's going to display, and I'm going to put must enter a value. All right. So now I go and run this, and it's going to pop up, and if I put something in there, I don't get the validation error message. If I don't put something in there, I will get the error message. So let's say this is like a name, all right? Name would probably be about, you know, one thing that we could, um, we would put a required field validator for. So we put something in here. We don't get the message. We, oh. If we're using this sort of validation, we have to make a small change to the web config. You can copy that from the web config for the for the trucking company example. Save you a little Googling. All right, so now we go and run it. If I omit it, I get the error message. If I put something in, I don't get the error message. Okay, so that's a required field validator. Um, now, let's look at the next kind of validator on the list. Let's see, what orders do I want to do it in? All right, I'm going to put a compare validator. A compare validator allows me to do two things. I can compare to see if the data I've entered matches a certain data type. So if I wanted to make sure that this is an integer, I could use a compare validator. I can also use a compare validator to compare two fields on the page. So if I have text box one and text box two, I could make sure that text box one is greater than text box two. Or, for example, um, when you have passwords, right, when you allow a user to register for a site, 
a lot of times you ask them to enter the password two times. And then you compare to make sure that they're equal, right? So you would use a compare validator that and compare to make sure that field one equals field two. All right, so we can use this two different ways. I'm going to use it in the way of making sure it's a certain data type. So I'm going to say, for example, must enter a date here. This is a little more complicated validator because not only do I enter the control to validate, I have to say how I want to validate it. Do I want to see if this control is equal to another control or not equal or greater than or greater than or equal or less than or less than or equal? Or am I just doing a data type check? Well, if we're just making sure that this is a date, then we're doing a data type check. And I have to specify then what the type of data is that I'm interested in. So a date. So I go and run this. Oh. I forgot to say the control to validate. So if I don't put anything in, it gives me that error. If I don't put a date in, it gives me that error. If I put a valid date in, it's okay with it. All right. Yes? So it only, <coughs> it only looks for the date, so it could also be a date in the past, but you have to specify that. Repeat that, please. Could you put uh, 2015 and it would still be all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because it only looks for. It only looks at make sure it's a valid date, right? Because, you know, what constitutes a valid date? Well, it depends what you're entering. It, you know, if you're talking about, um, you know, um, someone's birthday, yeah, it's definitely going to be in the past, right? Whereas if you're talking about when someone's driver's license expires, you know, well, hopefully, anyhow, it's going to be in the future. All right. Did you put that in that area for like restriction, or would you have to put that in your code? Well, you could approach that a couple different ways. If you wanted to validate that it was a future date, we actually did that in the rent a car example. I made a hidden field that I populated with today's date, yeah. and then I used a compare validator to compare the hidden text field with this. All right. Now, here's something important to notice. I'm going to temporarily delete the required field validator. And I'm going to run this. Didn't give me an error. That seems a little weird at first, but it really isn't. With a data type check, the data type check only works if there's something in the field. All right? So in other words, if there's a field that is required and it needs to be a date, you need two validators. One to force it to be required, one to force it to be a date. And again, that seems like extra work, but actually that's a good thing, right? Because you might have a field that is um, optional, but if it's entered in, it has to match a certain format. So, for example, maybe birthday. Maybe I have a site. But 
birthday might not be a required field. It's just, you know, Amazon will wish you happy birthday if you log on on your birth date or something like that, all right? Um, but it might not be required. Well, if you wanted that to be the case, if you wanted it not to be required, but if you entered it in, it had to be a validate, then you would just use a compare validator. If you wanted to make sure it was required and it had a valid date, then you would put a required field validator and a compare validator. So getting back to your question before, can you have more than one validator? Absolutely. Because again, most of these other validators really only work if there's, there's data entered. If there's no data entered, then it doesn't do the check that you've asked it to do. All right, it assumes it's an optional field, so I can put whatever I want to in. Now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna re-add uh, the required field validator. All right. I'm also going to go and edit this to show sort of what I'm doing here. Because I'm going to do a few examples on this one page. So text box one, the field is required and must be a date. And yeah. So field is required and it must be a date. when you check to make sure that the data entered is within a certain range. So, for example, if we were going to enter in the number of hours that an employee worked during a week, all right, they can't work a negative hours, and they can't work more than 168 hours, right, because there's only 168 hours in a week, all right? So, actually, the real upper limit is probably less than 168, but for the sake of argument, we'll put in 168. All right. So, I'm going to go in and put another text box. And I'm going to put a required field validator and a range validator. So, my required field validator... Control to validate, text box 2. The range validator, control to validate, text box 2. What data type it is. Say it's an integer. Minimum value zero, maximum value 168. So range validator, it's important to specify the data type because remember the way that you identify or the way that you compare whether one thing is less or greater than another depends on the data type. Yes. Um, yeah. I did. I actually thought in my head, it's always confusing for me because minimum is underneath maximum, so that had me confused. All right. And I do need to identify the kind of data it is. All right. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put another H1 that says required and 
must be between 0 to 168. So I go and run this. Again, if I don't put anything in there, I get the required field validators. If I put in a bogus number, a number that's too high, I get a range validator error, that it must be between 0 and 168. And again, if I were to delete the required field validator, the range validator is only going to work if I've entered a value. If I've not entered a value, the range validator doesn't kick in. So I don't enter a, valid, a, a number, I don't get a validation error. If I enter a number that's too high, then I get the validation error. Now what if I enter in something in that isn't an integer? I also get the range validation error, which is a good thing. That, that way I don't have to put a range validator and a compare validator. Because the range validator, if I specify as an integer, is smart enough to know if I type in letters that that's not an integer within the range. Yeah, yeah, I just forgot to do that. That's what I'm doing now. Must be between 0 and 168. And, in fact, I mean, it is important that you do that, you know. Um, I remember one form that I, um, I don't remember exactly exactly what the cause was, but it was so frustrating because it just told me, like, error in input. But it didn't tell me, like, what the error was, you know. And I eventually figured it out, but most users would just give up at that point. But I was persistent. I was curious, like, why I was getting an error. The data I entered looked good. Uh, but I forget. It was something, something silly about what it was expecting. I think it was like expecting a phone number without any dashes or something like that, and I was putting dashes in the phone number. Well, then tell me that, or tell me that when you, pre when you present the error. All right? So that's a required field validator along with a range validator. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a regular expression validator. So I'm going to put another text box on here. And I'm going to put a regular expression validator. And this one I'm going to check to see must be a valid email, but not required. Think of a re regular expression validator as being similar to checking the data type, except it's not checking a data type, it's checking a particular format. Certain numbers or certain pieces of data have a specific format. Phone numbers, right? Phone numbers in the United States, there's a three-digit area code, there's a th then there's three digits, and then there's four digits. A social security number is, I have to think of my own, three digits, then two digits, then four digits, I think. Mm -hmm. All right? Um, an email address is so many characters, an at sign, so many characters, a dot, then so many other characters. All right? Well, that's not a data type. There's not a data type for email or 
or phone numbers or whatever. They're all just basically strings. But we can check the format of those strings with a regular expression validator. So I can go in here for this and I can change the error message to say must be an email address. Control to validate, text box three, and then we have regular expression somewhere here. validation expression. Now if we click the little three dots here, it gives us some built-in standard expressions. So I'm going to pick an internet email address. And that, in a nutshell, is using the language of regular expressions, the description of what constitutes a valid email address. This is what exactly I described. So many characters, an at sign, so many characters, a dot, so many more characters. Now, if you want to come up with your own regular expressions for your particular problem, then you can write your own regular expression. It's not easy, but it's not impossible either. So, for example, What's something here at LCCC that we might have a regular expression for? Okay. And what is, um, what rule do any of those fields match? Uh, first initial. Okay. First initial, is there a period between the first initial? Oh, yeah, Okay. All right. So the rule could be it has to be a letter, a dot, then some more characters. What's another thing here at LC that might be you might need a regular expression for? You could use a regular expression for. Passwords. Passwords? We have to have a capital. We have to have a Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, uh, passwords have to the rules for a password. At first, I was, I was like, no, passwords don't, but you're right. Certain passwords, in fact, that's what drives me crazy because different places have different rules for their passwords. So what's a legal password in one place isn't for another. But the rules for a password depend on the organization, and you might have to have capital letters, lowercase letters, numbers, special characters. All right, so that's something you could write a regular expression for your organization's rule for a valid password. These are good answers. I, these are not ones that I thought of, so it's good you're, you're thinking about this. What I was thinking about is, is course names, or not course names, but course ID numbers. Every course here at LC is three, or I'm sorry, four letters followed by three numbers. So CISS243, ACCT151, and so on down the line. So you could write a regular expression for that. So if we had a form here that people use to create new courses, we could validate to make sure that those four characters, you know, that, that a course title had four characters followed by three characters. We could probably even do more than that, right? Because we know that the first number is going to either be a zero, one, or two. We don't have any courses in the threes here at LC, all right, given that we're a community college, a two-year college, all right? Um, whereas a university, they may have a similar rule, all right, but they may have courses that go 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, all right. Um, we're not going to write any regular expressions in this class, but it's good that you are aware that you could write your own rules. Um, we are going to use the standard ones, though. So if there's a phone number, if you're writing a, a web page and it's expecting a phone number, you should validate it to be... Uh, a valid phone number using a regular expression. All right. So let's go and run this.
So we did not make it required. So I can get away with not putting anything in there. But if I put something in there, it has to be a valid email address. Custom validator is kind of where you write your own validation rule. And we're not going to worry about that at this point. We're just doing sort of the standard validation rules. The idea of this is this allows you to still use the framework for validation um, and yet maybe your validation doesn't fit any of these criteria. Maybe you have a very complex sort of validation rule. I am going to do a compare validator where I put in a password 1 and 2 and they have to match. That's the other way that we can use a compare validator. So I'm going to put in two text boxes. I did not want it there, but I'll move it. And I'm going to put a required field on the first one and a compare validator for both of them. go here. Required and we have to make them so that they match. So I'm going to go and create a required field validator. one, compare validator. What is the first control I'm validating? Yeah, the text box five, four rather. Control to validate. Actually, that should be text box four. This should be text box five. And I'm comparing to see that they're equal. That's already set. I also have to specify the type and they are strings because they are passwords. So if I go and run this, if I don't enter anything in, I get told that I have to enter it in. If I enter something in here and not anything in there, it tells me that they don't match up. If they match, then I'm okay. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about, but we'll talk about now, is normally for things like passwords, you don't display what they're typing in the field. All right? That's actually a parameter or a property of the field. And if I look under text mode, I can put single line, multi-line, and so on and so forth.
Now, if you notice, there's actually fields for text no mode of date, date time, color, month, number, <coughs> range. These represent the HTML5 controls that you have. Now, you may still put a validator on it even if you use the HTML5 control. Why? Just in case someone is using an earlier version of the browser that doesn't support that HTML5 um, input control. All right? So here I made these passwords, which means that it won't echo the result in as I type it. So I can type in AAA. It shows like that. I can click on that to show it if I want. And there you go. All right. So those are the validation controls that I expect you to know. To review required field validator, make sure that um, something is, is um, entered in a field. Does it make sure what is entered in the field, but it makes sure that there's something in a, in a field. Um, a regular expression validator validates that the data that you entered matches some certain pattern like an email address or a phone number or a course number here at LC. A range validator makes sure that the range that the values that you entered fit within a certain range. A compare validator is probably the most confusing one because it has two modes that it works in. One is it makes sure that it is certain um, data type. So I can validate with a compare validator and make sure that what I've entered is a date. I can make sure that what I've entered is an integer. Um, the other thing I can do with a compare validator is make sure that two fields are equal, make sure that two fields are not equal, make sure field one is greater than field two, field two is greater than one, any combination of those things. That would be useful, for example, if I was entering a date range. And we saw an example of that in the truck calculation where we entered in, we wanted our starting date to be not later than our ending date. All right. The other question we had with validation related to the initial value. All right. So let's go and let's create a drop down. I'm going to say validate that the placeholder option is not chosen in a drop down. So the placeholder dry, uh, uh, by placeholder I mean the initial value. Remember, a drop down always has a value in web development. A drop down control always has a value. It's either the value the user selected, the value that you have defaulted via code, or if you haven't defaulted anything and the user hasn't chosen anything, then it's the top selection on the list. So I can make a drop down, and I'm going to go in, I'm going to edit items, I'm going to add four items. The first item is going to be, please make a selection. First one's going to be yes. Second one's going to be no. 
and the third one's going to be maybe. All right. So when I run this, I haven't put any validation on here yet. I've just created my dropdown with the four options on it. When I run this, the initial value is sort of my dummy option, my placeholder option that says, please make a selection. That should not count as a valid selection. All right? Why do I put it in there? I put that in there because if I didn't put that in there, then it would default to yes. All right? And I'm liable to get people that would pick yes without really reading the question. I want to force people to make sure that they've read the question and actually have put in an answer. So I want to have validation to make sure that they have not just merely left it at the first answer, but they've actually looked at that and deliberately chosen one of the options. But, again, that counts as an option, right? So if I put a required field validator, I have to tell the required field validator, well, here's the, here's the option that really doesn't count as a choice. In other words, here is the initial value for it that they have to change to something else. So, if I put a required field validator on this guy, I'm going to do it wrong first, then I'm going to do it right. <coughs> well, my message say must select yes, no, or maybe. And the control to validate is my drop down. If I go and run this, if I leave it at that right now, I click that, I don't get a validation there. Why? Because there's a choice in there. There's a choice. Please make a selection. All right? We have to somehow tell that validation control that that option that says please make a selection isn't really a, an option. It's just a placeholder. It's just holding a place at the top of the list. So, how do we do that? That's where the initial value comes in. So I have to go here and I have to put the value of that option. Well, what's the value of that option? Well, it's literally the words, please make a selection. So I will put as the initial value for that, Please make a selection. And then when I run this, if I leave it at that option, then it knows that it's not a valid choice. And then I have to pick one of the other ones. Now normally, you wouldn't do something like putting the full words, please make a selection, because that's real easy to mess up, right, if you capitalize it wrong or whatever. So usually what I do is I'll give the dummy selection like a value of negative 1 or something that isn't a value, and then I'll give the initial value equal to negative 1. And that'll work. Whoops, I did something wrong. Oh, I changed I changed the wrong thing. I changed the error message to be negative one.
So this should work the same way. Now, should you always have a dummy selection as the first item in your drop down? I don't think I said yes before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The an the answer the answer to these kind of questions usually is it depends on what you're doing. What if you did not have a dummy selection at the top? What would the effect of that be? Well, the effect of that would make the top one the default, right? So if you had something that you wanted to have a default value for, then you would not have a dummy selection. So, for example, like all these places, like when you register for their site, it's like, do you want to subscribe to our newsletter? All right. They will make yes the default to that. So if you click without thinking, you're going to get their newsletter every week or whatever. All right. So in the case where there is a default value, then you wouldn't have a dummy selection at the top. And when's there a default value? Well, that's a judgment call for you. It's a usability um, issue uh, versus an accuracy issue. The problem with a default is that there's going to be some people that aren't going to read the question, and if they're not forced to make a selection, they're just going to get stuck with the default. Well, you should be pretty sure that the default is something that is uh, a reasonable thing to have a default. For example, if I was, you know, if I was registering for, um, if I was making a, um, something to uh, register students for here at LC, it might be reasonable to assume to default the state to Ohio, all right? Because I would think most of the students that attend LC, their address, their mailing address is in Ohio, all right? Now, are all of them? No. There are students, I've gotten, I've had students that uh, attend like distance learning classes, they may live in another state, all right? But it would be reasonable to default the state to Ohio, all right? But you don't put a default in just so you don't have to put validation, right? Because if you have a default value on a drop down, there's really no need to have validation anymore, all right? You said, well, if they don't make a selection, this is what I want it to be. So you have to make the judgment call and say, is this something that I, is there a reasonable default for this? Um, and if there is a reasonable default, then you don't need a dummy selection. You just make the default the default. If there is uh, no reasonable default, or if the consequences of the user making the wrong choice are big, then you would want to put a dummy choice and not have a default. I'm thinking of something like, do you agree to the terms and conditions? All right? There's never a default for that, right? Because they want to they want to force you to pick, yes, I, I do. Because if you if there was a default for it, you could say, you know, I really didn't read that. Why did it let me go in without allow, you know, without requiring me to say that I read the terms and conditions or whatever. So they want to make sure that you pick that explicitly. This isn't everything about validation, but it's a good portion of it. All right. Any questions on the validation aspect of this? All right. Let's see where that leaves us. No, but it definitely helps. Good. We have a couple relating to CSS. One about turning the logic into code. Switching between, let's try to talk about these two. Switching between designer and code can be confusing and renaming the application. Okay. One thing to keep in mind is that, and this is true of 
of any what they call WYSIWYG or graphical web development tool is if you can draw it on the screen, it has to guess what the best CSS is for and, and, and how to handle that. All right? So if I go, if I'm in graphical mode, And I want to put a label down here underneath the button. All right. Notice, first of all, I didn't put it underneath it. I put alongside of it. Let's try this again. Let's hit return a couple of times. And let's go and drag a label here. All right, I'll put a label there. All right. It has to guess what the best HTML, CSS combination is to do that. All right? And the tool isn't sophisticated. It doesn't have judgment. It doesn't, like, understand the rules of web development. It's a very brute force sort of thing. So what do you think it did to put that label there? Because it could accomplish this a bunch of different ways. How do you think it accomplished it? Any guesses? Well, let's find out. Are you talking about the percentage? Well, how did it know? I hit a bunch of new lines, and I dragged a label over there. How did it know? What HTML code did it generate to make that label down below the button? <coughs> well, let's look. It put a bunch of break tags, all right, which is not a good development process. All right. So I would be very leery about making changes in the graphical mode. All right. Let's make another change that we can do. Let's make this bigger. Well, because it's trying to generate HTML to do that. Let's go and know, let's go and look to see what HTML it changed. It made it wider, but it didn't make it any taller. It went and added to that. I lost track of which text box I changed. Okay, I changed the drop down, not a text box. it went and put those HTML attributes, put those attributes in here. All right? Which, again, isn't necessarily the best way to do it. All right? So to answer this question about sort of how to manage between using CSS and using the GUI, I would, I generally would use, uh, not use the visual designer to design it. Use the visual designer to plop it on the page and uh, explore the properties and set the properties and so on. But to actually do the layout and do the styling, I would use CSS. Now, there is a handful of things that you can, uh, that, that are very difficult to do via CSS. But most of your styling is pretty straightforward to do in CSS if you remember what HTML is going to get generated. All right? Because there's no CSS for ASP.NET controls. All your CSS selectors that you create are based on tags, IDs or classes. So I would use CSS as much as possible and only use the ASP.NET sort of styling as a last resort. And there's a few cases where that's required and we'll save those for later on um, in the course. So that's my personal philosophy for that. And the reason for that, again, is if you think in terms of responsive web development, making a web page that works well 
both on a mobile device and on a desktop device. Those solutions typically are going to be CSS driven. So use that tool. There's others that will probably disagree with that approach. But in my mind, that's the best approach to take, is to have, is to do it via, via CSS. That gives you the flexibility to apply different style sheets under different circumstances, namely for um, different, um, different um, sort of devices and device sizes. So to answer that question, um, I would avoid using the graphical interface to do much about the layout, other than just plopping things down and then writing your own CSS code to position them. Now, about renaming an application, I'm going to go out of this. And here's my review. I'm going to go rename this to review 0915. All right. If I go up here, and run it. Should not have a problem other than it's complaining that the solution isn't saved. There we go. Now, this could be the manner in which you're opening it causing you problems. And that's why I always suggest if you were to rename this, to not double click the solution file or anything like that, but to always go and say file, open, website, and pick the website that way. Pick the folder that contains the web config file, pick it that way. And then you can run it and it should run correctly. Now what becomes a bigger problem is if you want to rename a page. All right? Because a page, if you look, you can do it, but there's several things, including the code behind file and all that, where it thinks that the name is default. So you got to get you got to get several things right when you rename a page. Typically what I do is I create a new page and I just copy stuff in. Yeah, it, that, that proves to be less of a pain than trying to re rename it. Because there always seems to be something I forget. And rather than spending time wrestling with that, usually just creating a new page and copying the code in usually works just as well. Now, if I, I want to back up for one second about CSS versus ASP.NET. Um, that is a tricky subject. And I, I don't, I'm not pretending that I've answered all the potential issues that you're going to have with that. But as a general approach, I favor using the CSS for that. Use that tool for what it's, it's meant to do and uh, um, do most of your styling that way and not really do styling in the graphical mode or via the ASP.NET properties. We'll pick up next time where we left off today. And we will um, go over then creating a um, object for a class and an object for our uh, truck rental. Um.